Good afternoon. I'm Ed Poswoli, CEO of Trip Scott, and today we're with our friend Stephen Moore. Stephen, welcome. It's good to be back. Stephen, you know, your background, again, speaks to uh, the Heritage Foundation, a, a distinguished fellow in economics, and the many books that you've written, the Trumponomics books. I mean, let's talk about Trumponomics versus Bidenomics. I mean, the, the stock market's been all the rage the last couple of months or so, and, and been, the economy has remained pretty strong. Does President Biden deserve any credit for that? Well, look, um, the overall economy for middle class America is not good. And if you look at one of the statistics that I was showing President Trump just last week was that if you look under um, Trump in the uh, four years he was in office, median household income grew by $6,400 in real terms, adjusted for inflation. That's a, that's a big number in right. four years. You know what that number is under Biden even up to today? Negative 2,000. So what I'm saying, Ed, is the average middle-class American is poorer today than they were when Trump left office. And that's why you're seeing in these polls, a Americans disconnect. aren't buying it. Right. Now, you know, is the stock market on a, a bullish run? Absolutely it is. We've got a great American companies. Uh, and I'm all in favor of a bull market. But I don't think that, uh, I think Biden has, um, has been the most financially reckless president we've ever had in this country, at least in my lifetime. Why do you we, say that? Why? Yeah. Because our debt has never accelerated like this, especially during a period of, um, you know, the, usually when we have big increases in debt, it's been during a crisis. We borrowed a lot during the Revolutionary War, then we paid it down. We borrowed a lot during the Civil War, then we paid it down. We borrowed a lot during the Great Depression, then we paid it down. And after World War II, the debt came down. This is the first time in American history where we're borrowing massive amounts of money. The COVID crisis ended two or three years ago. What, why are we borrowing money today at this uh, pace? So um, we are living on borrowed time. It's that simple. The red ink is a tsunami. Americans understand that it's like termites in the basement. Something's fundamentally wrong with our country. Now, look, I'm a Trump guy. Trump's fiscal record wasn't so good either. So I'll admit that. I mean, we ran pretty big deficits under Trump, but uh, nothing like this. And so uh, it's very worrisome. And most Americans just feel like their financial situation is worse off because it is. So kitchen table conversations yeah. in mid-America are saying, are feeling the pinch on inflation yes, and the sure. cost of groceries, the cost of fuel. Yeah. And Let so me give you some examples. So, you know, the official inflation um, rate right now is three and a half percent. I can't tell you how many times, you know, I, when I go to the grocery store with my wife or go to the hardware store, people literally come up to me and say, they're, they're angry at me. They'll say, why do you keep saying inflation is only three and a half percent? I say, well, that's the you know number that the Bureau of Labor said. No, it's not. And people, most people don't feel that their own personal inflation rate is three and a half percent. They think it's two or three times higher. That's because if you look at the essentials that people have to buy. So in three years, food prices are up 22%. In three years, mortgage payments are up 40%. In three years, a gas prices are up at 35%. Uh, utility bills are up. Now, are computer costs falling? Yes, are communication, you know, communications costs falling? Yes, but the things people have to buy those have gone up way faster than um, people's incomes. And that's the problem. And so what I've told Trump is, look, this is not a complicated campaign. You just have to look straight in that camera, sir, when you're debating Joe Biden, assuming, and, and assuming you know, Joe Biden. Biden may not be the nominee, but if he is, you just ask the American people, and this is gonna sound familiar, Ed, because remember, it's what Ronald Reagan said yep. when he debated Jimmy Carter. Are you better off today than four years ago? And most Americans say no. And that's what it comes down to. Yep. And in the end, it's a pocketbook issue. Not only that. I mean, yes, you have, it's not just the economy. I mean, what else is going right in the country? Our foreign policy is a disaster. The border is out of control. Crime in the streets. Our cities are dying. Um, it's hard to point to any victory Biden has really had. I mean, what has he done right? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I can tell you. I mean, you did mention what the stock market is doing, but even the stock market. So let me address that one. If you look at real terms, because remember, when you, you know this, when you make an investment, you're interested in your after inflation return, not your before inflation right. return. So I looked at the first three years of the S&P 500 under Trump versus the first three years of the S&P 500 under Biden. The, the S&P 500 was up 8% in real terms in three years under Biden. That's pretty poor, you know, pretty poor. 
You know what the number was under Trump? 32%. Wow. So the stock market did better under Trump than uh, Biden as well. Well, and the feeling of, of wealth you know, what somebody has in their 401k or their pension plan, that's directly related to that. Yeah. Now, look, I do think, I do think this, robotics inter, this, uh, this robotics and artificial intelligence age that we're moving into is, is like the new internet age. Right. And remember, you know, we, we live get through- We get a big push, yeah, right. Yeah, and you know, God bless America. We're dominating that just as we dominated, um, you know, the internet age. You know, you look at these trillion dollar companies that were created, Google, Apple, Amazon. Uh, and, and I want to see America dominate that too. I mean, Biden is so off message though. He thinks the future is green energy. You know what the worst performing stocks were last year? Yeah. Green energy. Right. You know what the best performing stocks were? Oil and gas. So he's betting on losing stocks. And uh, my point is we got to get government out of the way of picking winners and losers. That's not what the government does. You know, And they don't do it well. <laughs> they sure don't. <laughs> right. Really good point. Right. So you recently wrote a column about the, the the classic picture between Republicans being rich and 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 Democrats really mm -hmm. talking to more of the working man and, yeah. and racial minorities, et cetera. Where has that gone? I mean, it's really interesting because in the years that you and I have followed politics, you know, I got I was kind of baptized in 1980, you know, when Reagan first ran. Sure. That was the first candidate I really paid much attention to. But if you look in like the 80s when Reagan, you know, won two landslide elections. If you looked at like the the districts, the congressional districts around the country, um, and you you know you have the poorest districts to the richest districts, for Reagan it was pretty linear. The the wealthier the district, the higher the um, percentage of the vote he got. It's not like that today. It, under Trump, it's really become uh, a, like an end curve. So uh, you know Trump does poorly in the very poor districts. He he actually loses the very wealthy districts. He has turned the Republican Party, for better or worse, into the blue-collar, middle-class party. That's what the Republican Party is today, again, for better or worse. Great article just today in the Wall Street Journal, I don't know if you saw it, Ed, about voters in Michigan. Did you happen to I read did. that? It was amazing, wasn't yeah, it? It was. I mean, they were just interviewing truck drivers and you know, real Americans with real jobs outside the Beltway. And they were saying, I'm sick of this DEI stuff, this ESG stuff, LGBTQ. You know, I, Trump speaks my language. He speaks for me. And it's kind of amazing because Trump is, you know, a, a billionaire, you know, he, he, but he connects with those middle class voters. And, and, you know, there's a kind of patriotism to Trump's message that I find endearing. And, you know, I don't, the Biden, you know, you, you look what he's like, why is he doing what he's doing? It's hurting this country. And so I, I love that message of kind of putting America first. And that's what a president should do. Wasn't it this weekend that Teamsters just came out and was going to support the RNC in some big way? Um, that hadn't happened since Reagan, effectively. So what's the status of that? I know they've gone back. They've gone back and forth. Yeah. But, but the, the fact that they're even entertaining know, exactly. it is, is Well, amazing. I think, I may be wrong about that. I think the Teamsters endorsed Ronald Reagan back They did. That's what I'm saying. And so, you know, but I'll guarantee you this. I don't care who their union bosses endorse. 70% of those truck drivers are Trump voters. And this is where, this is my problem with the union movement. Uh, they're not representing the interests of their own members because, you know, you look at the miners, you look at the truck drivers, you look at the UAW workers, you look at the carpenters. Those, those are all, so, union, you know, Trump voters, it, and yet the union bosses endorse Biden. Since we're talking uh, right after the South Carolina primary, <laughs> it looks like Trump is going to be the Republican nominee it, it, mm -hmm. for all it's, intents and purposes. Much but on the other side, it, Joe Biden, you know, won South Carolina, but... Do we believe that he's going to be the nominee? When I say my prayers at night, I say, please, God, keep Joe Biden healthy, please. <laughs> we want to run against Joe Biden. I think Trump will kick his ass, frankly. Uh, and, but I'm very nervous. I, I don't if, think if it's not person. him, then who? I think it would be one of three people, either um, Michelle, uh, Michelle I don't, Obama. I don't. Every Democrat I know who you know is in the know says she doesn't want to run. But we'll see. The second possibility, of course, is the governor, Gavin Newsom of California. And he's a slick guy. He's like a Bill Clinton guy. He's but his record guy. is terrible, right? Well, Bill Clinton governed from the middle to the left, yeah. right? I don't know if you could say the same thing about no Gavin No way. Newsom. I mean, he's, right. he's not Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton was a true centrist, moderate right. Democrat. Right. The problem is that, uh, you know, uh, 
Gavin Newsom has a record in California. It's yeah, a disaster. It's pretty bad. Yeah, it's a disastrous record. You know, you saw that debate when uh, your governor here, Ron DeSantis, I mean, just flattened on every single statistic. Florida is doing so much better than California. And then the one I'm probably most worried about is Gretchen Whitmer. She's the governor of Michigan. Look, this is a five state election. It's Georgia, it's Pennsylvania, it's Michigan, it's Wisconsin, and Arizona. Whoever wins three of those five will be the next president. Trump is winning in Michigan, so they're worried about losing Michigan. And if they put Whitmer on, who's there, you know, that might swing that state. So I hope it's not her. I hope they stick with Biden. I mean, but she was a, a bit of a disaster during COVID. She was. Not a bit of a disaster, a total disaster. But then she I still being, got reelected. I was being kind. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Uh, but she somehow still got reelected, even though she had that horrific record. Um, look, I think Whitmer is one of the most overrated politicians, but, um, you know, we've got to win Michigan. And how do you think it plays? And I'm not talking now about the constitutional parameters about the, uh, what happened in New York with respect to the judge in New York uh, a ruling uh, against Trump for $350 million. What does that say? Hmm. I, want, I want to focus less on the politics, but more on the economic impact of New York City and New York, generally speaking, when a court uh, basically uh, can rule and, and the impact of that. How do you see that impacting business in New York? Yeah, I mean, I, I think any fair-minded person would look at that verdict and say it's the most outrageous, crazy thing. I mean, there's no, by the way, there's no victim. No here. victim. Yeah. <laughs> How do you reward $350 million? To whom? Who was, who was harmed? No one was. In fact, the people who bought his properties made money on those. They didn't. So it is, it is a preposterous verdict. Um, and you're right. The big loser here is the state of, of New York and the city of New York. I mean, who wants to invest there? Donald Trump, whether you like Donald Trump or not, I mean, he helped build that great city. You know, he really he built buildings. He brought renewal to some of the bad areas of the city. And this is how they repay him. So no, you're right. They, you know, come to Florida, right? They're not going to they're not going to pull that stuff here in a state like Florida or a state like Idaho or Montana. I mean, look, one of my whole premises is America really truly is two countries today. We are. It's, you know, it, we're a red state America and we're blue state America. And the progressives run the blue states like New York, like New Jersey, like California. And, you know, red states like Tennessee and Texas and Florida are run very differently. And you know what? The red states are absolutely destroying the blue states. You know, you, you know this for the first time in history. You probably know this. The first time in American history, the southeast is now the single biggest a contributor to the GMP. Wow. We've surpassed the, the Northeast. Northeast with New York, Philadelphia, Boston. It's because the jobs are moving here, the capital is moving here, the people are moving here. Um, so, uh, you know, this has to be the Republican message. Do you want America to look like California and New York, or do you want America to look like Tennessee and Texas and Florida? To me, that's a no-brainer. Right. You know, do you want to be East Germany or do you want to be West Germany? One last point before we, before we say goodbye. Yeah. Um, because of the impact of the Fed, how is, how is Chairman Powell doing? What are, you, what are your thoughts on the Fed policy today? Well, I talked to President Trump about this. There's no question that he will replace Jerome Powell. He always says it was one of his biggest mistakes. I think Powell, I would give him a C minus. You know, um, he's done a pretty good job of late, but he really hurt Trump at the beginning. Remember when he tightened? Yeah. And remember, do you remember that Christmas when yeah. the stock market just tanked? Because he kept raising rates, which and Trump, I, Trump was pulling his hair out. He was so angry, and that was like this little mini recession that didn't have to happen. It was all because Powell, you know, miscalculated. And then, you know, look, Jerome Powell, what was the one who, you know, along with Joe Biden, gave us nine point two percent inflation, the worst inflation rate we've had since Jimmy Carter was president. He was a little late to the party on that one. I would say so. Right. You know, and so I think he has to be held accountable for that, and he has to be removed. And let's put Larry Kudlow in there. How about that? That'd be great. <laughs> That'd be great. On that note, let's. Steve, thank you so much. I really do appreciate the time, and your insights are always interesting to our to our viewers, and do appreciate your all, all your work. Good to be with you, you again. Thank you. Thank you.